Um, so as folks are joining, just a note that this is a webinar and not a um, not a meeting. And so we will not be able to see you. Uh, we will be able to um, interact with you. And uh, my colleague Felipe Sanchez is here. Felipe is uh, going to be throughout this session and all the rest in the series. He is going to be in the chat and he's going to be looking at the Q&A, which you can also use. Um, and just kind of interacting there. You can also um, you can also message Felipe directly. Uh, if, you, if you are experiencing any technical difficulties or if you have any questions about kind of how to do something like how do I ask a question that sort of thing. Um, I am now going to put an open ended question into the chat and I'm going to read it out loud as well. And before we get started, um, I would love to just hear your responses to this. So the question is, how do you think, just from your experience, working in theater has changed, if at all, in the past few months? So this is a question to all of you viewing, um, all of you students. And we're going to have this in the chat instead of raising hands at the moment. Um, I do see a raised hand there and um, Amanda, if you could put your response in the chat or if you do have a question, um, maybe Felipe can, can message you there too. Lots of online and virtual performances. Thanks, Harley. Yes. Okay, looks like the polling has slowed down a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results here. This is so, the poll is today, I'm most curious about the following topics related to working in theater. Looks like the top one is where and how to find work. <laughs> Next up, building a network, addressing and dismantling structural racism and inequity, staying creatively fulfilled, paying my bills, <laughs> finding a mentor, and how to raise money for my projects. Very interesting. Okay. Um, I am going to stop Felipe's video. Uh, and thank you, Felipe. <laughs> um, and before I introduce our amazing guests, I'm going to just highlight some of these in the in the chat. Um, and I encourage all of you throughout this to um, to talk to each other in the chat. This you all can see these if you go to all panelists and attendees, then your response goes to everybody. Um, so how theater has changed. It's difficult to navigate, adjust to new circumstances, huge impact on the industry, systemic issues of predominantly white institutions. Yes. Lovely. Thank you all for this. Okay. So welcome to Center Theater Group's Working in Theater Summer Series. Uh, my name is Camille Schenken and I work in the Education and Community Partnerships Department at CTG. I'm so excited to spend this time with all of you. I will be learning right alongside you. We have an incredible array of guests for the summer. And I am super excited to be with these two folks for today um, to get us started. Uh, I want to just say that Wi-Fi may cut out. Um, my children might wander in. Pets may make appearances. We have also discovered while we were trying this that Christina's audio will cut out if there's any sound from the other two of us. So Jessica and I will be trying to mute ourselves and not, um, not interfere with that. We don't know what's happening there, but yay technology. Um, another housekeeping thing, a bunch of you emailed me um, and said, what if I miss a session or what are the expectations? None, it's not school. We love to have you with us. You're not being graded. You don't have to email me if you're going to be late. Don't have to email me if you're going to miss a session. We hope you'll be here for as many as possible. We do intend on recording. 
um, but we will not necessarily be sharing out that recording at any given time. Um, and it may end up being just for archival purposes. You can change the sound issues in your setting. We were, we were investigating, we were unsuccessful with that, Eileen, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get started. Yay, uh, I'm gonna start by just reading a little bit of your bios. Your full bios were sent out to everyone and folks, if you don't have the, um, the, the access to the Dropbox, just email me later and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through getting that because they also put an incredible resource in there. Uh, with lots of really great advice. Christina Wong was featured in the New York Times Off Color series highlighting artists of color who use humor to make smart social statements about the sometimes subtle, sometimes obvious ways that race plays out in America today. She is a performance artist, comedian, writer, and elected representative who has been presented internationally <laughs> across North America, the UK, Hong Kong, and Africa. Uh, She's been a guest on late night shows on Comedy Central and FX and an actor on film and TV. Her newest performance project is Christina Wong for Public Office, a simultaneous real life stint in public office and a show. In her most blurry performance piece yet, Christina currently serves as the elected representative of Wilshire Center, Koreatown, Sub District 5 Neighborhood Council. Welcome, Christina. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Jessica Kubzanski is a champion of innovation and artistic excellence and the artistic director of Boston Court Pasadena, a theater primarily dedicated to adventurous new work and re classics that engage the cultural conversation. She is an award-winning director working locally and nationally on new works, classics, and exciting new adaptations of classics. In addition to many shows at Boston Court, she has directed at the Pasadena Playhouse, A Noise Within, Arena Stage, South Coast Rep, and ACT Seattle, among many other places. Um, thank you both for being here. I'm going to ask you each to talk a little bit about your work and how it's changed over the past few months in particular. Um, but I do want to start with the statement, and I sent this out to everybody um, who is participating. There, was, there is a movement, the We See You White American Theater statement. Um, and I hope everybody had a chance to look at that. And if you don't, I, I really recommend taking a look. It is uh, an incredible statement and um, something that I am hopeful but skeptical represents a sea change in American theater. But I wanted to ask you all, and we've been chatting about this a little bit, do you think that this is a shift? Why, why do you think that this is happening now? And where are you on that hopeful, skeptical, Sure. I, I'll jump in. Uh, when I first saw that letter, I, I was like, I didn't know this was happening. And I was also just sort of like, wow, this is, this is a real call out. Um, this is huge to call, to call out, to name it by name it as white American theater and, and to, to name like all these microaggressions that I sort of had to dance with my whole life as a, my, my, what, yes, I guess my whole life as, as both a person of color, but also um, someone who is working in theater as, is like, do I say something in that moment? How do I critique the institution that I'm performing in while still taking money from them to do this critique on their stage, you know? And, and I was just like, wow, this is so bold. And I, I think a lot of it is happening. Uh, I've heard right now described as an implosion, a complete implosion of our field. Um, I see it as a reckoning as well. Um, I think it's because, to, to be honest, we, we don't know, uh, I've, I've heard Michael Ritchie say that, that he doesn't see theater, um, CTG at least opening until spring next year, if that. Um, so we have this moment to pause and think, what is it that we wanna return to? And we are also having this huge racial reckoning right now where we're realizing that um, Black folks in this country have been s sitting on this, uh, s sitting in the state for 400 years, and and uh, we finally need to confront this demon in the room, this original sin in the room, and and I think that's why this is happening, because we have this space where we're not rushing to the next season, the next show, and we have to really think what hasn't been working this whole time. So it's um, I've been describing it as. It feels like we're in group therapy with really abusive family members 
who might be <laughs> been her, except there's no therapists and there's no therapy. It's just the internet. And so it's a little trickier to figure out how do we move forward? What are the next steps? Um, and, and where we find healing in all this, because it is much easier to call out people on the internet. But for me, I'm also like, wow, this is gonna be awkward when we have to all see each other in the lobby. <laughs> Jessica, your thoughts. Well, speaking as a white woman who runs a primarily white institution with, <clears throat> you know, passionate desires to serve, to sort of represent our actual world on stage. And, and you know, I am just, I think it's a kind of amazing document that is really powerful and profound. I think the systemic, the system that we have all been operating in um has to be dismantled you know i am looking at the ways in which i am guilty of inherent white privilege um i am sad that it has taken such an extreme moment to make it be such a call to arms for frankly for white people who are the people who don't doesn't it doesn't feel like have had to think about it even though everyone should have been and i think that is actually part of what is really powerful and profound and uncomfortable, appropriately so, and frankly for white people who have been comfortable for far too long. Um, and by the way, I of course indict myself in this, absolutely. And um, so I think it's really powerful and important. And I actually think the pandemic is the reason why it's happening in quite this way, because the entire field is becalmed and no one is in tech right now, and no one is hurrying to finish their commission, and no one is you know, rushing to get to rehearsal and, um, or build the set or any of the things that um, people would, or, and you know, one, of the, one of the interesting conversations in the last set of um, <laughs> conversations about the pandemic was how people wear as a badge of honor the fact that their, their exhaustion and their 90 hour work weeks and things like that. But <laughs> this moment has forced us to slow down. And while no one is actually practicing the art, except for, as I saw in the chat, many, many Zoom readings and radio plays and things like that, they've had a chance to actually pull back, really look at the system that at, we've all been operating in and say, hey, this has to change in very profound ways. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. And I'm also humbled and passionate about doing the work to become a better anti-racist in every way. Yeah. I would say also, this is, uh, we are in the, uh, I went through many phases in my career where it's like, I'm so sick of talking about race. Can't I do something that has nothing to do with race? Everything has to do with race. So, um, and I did attempt at one point to write a play that was like, not gonna be about race and, and it's impossible. And even if a play just is, is about a white family having dinner, it's still about race, right? And, and this whole system of the subscriber model and capitalism, it's all built on white supremacy. It's all built yeah. on on stolen labor and and it has trickled even into our our theater world where we just do things for passion like <laughs> the things are still at play and so i i, I uh, camille had actually said should we confront this um or or talk about this we see white american theater in a panel about making theater for a living and at first i was like but this isn't doesn't really have to do with the nuts and bolts but it absolutely does like i think you can't ignore a cultural moment the news history <laughs> and context and if you are just wanting to do theater and never address any cultural political issue do something else because you're in the wrong field this yeah. is absolutely the field that is about even if you're just saying lines and crying on cue you are the vehicle that is that is carrying forward culture and, and culture holds a lot of political power culture is what got um g gay marriage legalized yeah. uh, because we had a precedent of amazing gay culture and TV shows and characters that made it quite like conceivable for the people in the Supreme Court to go, wait, okay, <laughs> this isn't right. So, so uh, I mean, that's not even on my little pre-reading list, but like recognize that what you do is inherently political, even if you're just trying to sing and dance. Um, and so you have to be part of these conversations and recognize that this is not something that 
you know, oh, I just want to do musical theater. No, you, you need to participate in these conversations because this is our field right now. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I, 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 I have been powerfully looking at the system that we all operate in because I, you know, the, the things that are, you know, the ways in which we define success, the ways in which we all operate, the, the barriers to access that seem like part of what is just the way it is, you know, all of that has to really be re-examined, taken apart. And we, it's, it's actually exciting to be in the moment of finding the next better way, you know, I will say. I, and I really want to look at it that way. I want to look as challenging as it is. I want to look at it as an opportunity to become our better selves. So I, I want to talk about that because we have 225 people, the vast majority of which identify as early career. Um, what does that look like? If we're talking about this being a hard reset for our field, where everything basically stops, and let's say we're even going to look at changing um, large theaters, small theaters, the nonprofit community, funding. How do we move forward out of this? What, what would you all like to see change as a result of this particular cultural, political, and pandemic-y moment? And I know that's a big question. And also, everybody, I love what's happening in the chat. I am Hard to at it too. So I know. I confess, I Camille, know. can you encapsulate your question again? Because I was reading a really smart thing in the chat and I got distracted. I'm so sorry. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And Felipe just also sent the uh, We See You at American Theater link in the chat as well. Um, okay, so if we think about this moment where we are right now is the closest that we will come to like the hard reset for American theater of like, let's, let's stop it. Let's change it. Let's figure out how to do it better. What's involved with that? How, what is the way forward and how do people who are just coming up in this industry, what are some choices that they can make or ways that they can look at this um, to, to change things? I know there's so much there. <laughs> Christina, do you want to take it? Oh. <laughs> Recognizing that this is political work and you have to be part of political conversations and there's no such thing as a neutral body. I've been told before, like, I just want to cast neutral actors. And I, and I so much wanted to say in that moment, I think you're saying white and that's driving me crazy because <laughs> I think you're implying that there are some bodies that have like, that can just be anything and some that are not. And there's no such neutral body and someone had just said that in the comments and I was like oh I have a story that goes with that um but I, th I I I think this whole dismantling really means understanding who's in charge who makes the decisions who's being produced who does the producing and most of this theater system is and same with Hollywood right because uh, some of us work there too is is predominantly white and, and has relied on a white older white subscription base um which some programmers are scared of challenging or scared of, uh, oh, we can't have too many black bodies on the stage. Oh, we can't have too much. If the story's too Asian, it'll be too weird for them. So we'll have to slot it into our special voices series or whatever. But I, I it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a lot about just sort of inverting the whole system, which I can't, quickly tell you succinctly how that happens, but I think it really means kind of reconsidering who whose voice is heard and and how white folks need to cede power or at least if you're I'm not saying you uh, you necessarily need to resign um, but but maybe look around you and see who who are the voices of color who aren't being heard or qualified and 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 why are you avoiding conversations and um, and how can the initiative just be the programming of your whole theater uh, this is a big question. <laughs> I mean, a lot of uh, how I've worked, which maybe can lead us more into how we've done theater is I, 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 I'm not an equity member, yet I tour my own shows that I've written and I've made a field for myself by touring a lot of colleges. And, um, and a lot of that was because if I, if I were to rely on making a living on just auditioning and hoping that someone had the vision to see me in their role, I would not be working at all. You know, um, so a lot of it, I, I feel like, is about 
understanding how theater is is actively making culture and not just entertaining us with song and dance. I'm going to pass it to Jessica as I think on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the power that I, 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 I'm seeing so many things going on in the chat, both about programming on stage, but all, also barriers to access. Um, and that includes ticket prices and that and um, and that includes the people that um, that people see in the lobby. Um, and that includes really being embedded in communities. And um, I, all of that is, are things that we are, and actually just to say, we're already deeply examining in the ways in which, for instance, Boston Court, I think is better known in our artistic community than it is in our geographical community. And um, we have had an initiative which got <laughs> paused by the pandemic to really embed artists in our community and get, you know, for us to get to know our geographical community better. Um, and, um, and in fact, to um, commission artists to sort of embed in the community and respond to it and things like that. Um, and uh, that's just one of the ways in which I think, you know, Boston Court relatively recently became a voting center. Um, because we really wanted to be of service to our community in a much better way. And so, anyhow, I mean, there is so much work we all have to do in order to um, dismantle the system. And that it, it absolutely involves examining subscription models and actually even um, how, how theaters receive work and if it's agent driven only, and if that is actually a barrier to access and things like that. And so all of, there's so many huge questions and I'm so grateful for this moment to really examine every practice and say, is this actually operating in the system because someone told us this is how it's supposed to go? Or is this actually serving community? And I think we've all been guilty of going, well, this is how you're supposed to do theater. And I actually think like, if you're early career, you get to ask, you should be asking those questions, partially because you're not encrusted by years of being in a place where it's like, well, this is how we've always done it, you know? So um, I value that fresh perspective and brilliant ideas, like out of the box thinking um, and communicating and understanding what power you have to share great ideas. Um, and unless unless the institution is genuinely not open to innovation, they should be so grateful for all the things you're bringing. I mean, you know, I mean, why we make, in the ideal world, why we make theater is because it's a collective collaboration that together makes magic. And so the collective is so powerful because everyone has a great idea, you know? Um, and Absolutely. The, yeah. And I think it's also exciting. One thing that I've been focusing on is my sphere of influence and what, what I can do from the position that I hold. And there's so many decisions that all of us make and that all of, all of you who are watching make on a daily basis as you're making art, as you're thinking about art, you hold power where whatever phase you are at in your career, everything from if you have to order food for a meeting, where are you ordering it for, from, right? If you, if somebody says, hey, do you know a great stage manager? Who are you recommending, right? There's, there are so many, so many ways that all of us can move this conversation forward and, and change these systems, right? Also saying that, yes, it needs to come from the top and that we need to radically yes. examine the way that everything is handled, even funding, especially funding. Yeah. Can you ever you? Yeah, no question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Self-taping, how does it know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Christina, I, you know, as also we were talking about this, um, we were talking about your business model as we were planning for this conversation. And uh, it, it, those of you who are able to watch the intro video for this series, um, one of the things that I shared was like the discrepancy between what excites early career folks in these in these uh, conversations and what we hear from people about 
what they realize post college is important to know or learn. And one of those big things is kind of business and entrepreneurship. And so I wonder if Christina, you can talk about your, your business model. So I, I sort of describe what I do is I'm like the I'm like an old school Times Square hawker where I've got it like my trench coat and I'm like, what do you want? You want a, you want a one person show? You want a keynote speech? You want a workshop? You, <laughs> you want a host? You want a few lines and a, a cartoon? What do you want? You want an essay? And um, because that's, I've, I've, the last time I had a part-time job uh, unrelated to my work as an artist was, was 2005, right? And, and uh, so I've had to just have a diverse portfolio where I, I had to negotiate a lot of places, a lot of, like I had said um, before, my, the, uh, when I do my taxes at the end of the year, my accountant is always like, what is this? Because it's all these 1099s from different schools and then it's not the same school year after year. And um, I just sort of went off the model of what I witnessed when I was at UCLA, which was all these visiting artists who made their own work. And it was weird work and it was site specific work and and they weren't the kind of actors or performers that I would see on commercials or whatever, but they were just talking about really in, intense personal and yet political subjects and and I was like that's what I want to do i i want I want to kind of call the shots and so a lot of that road out of school was uh I would say if this is the road you want to go on where you want to um a lot of artists I know who are not just working in plays, they've been cast in and stuff. Uh, they, they, they figure out how to synthesize their story, whether it's a one person show or keynote speech and, and sort of apply that philosophy throughout what they do and teach and offer. And for me, I did a one person show about depression and suicide called um, Wonk Live the Cuckoo's Nest, which uh, led to lots of invites to both tour the show and now because it's so exhausting to do the show, I give speeches on it. I write essays on it and it's essentially the same story over and over again. Um, but as I grow older, I have more to add and, and more deft ways to describe and talk about it and to report on the time. So I, I feel like this is a long story, but it's like thinking like, what are the, what's the story of your life? And what is, what is that that makes you unique? I think that's so counter to how we think about casting or how I thought about to think about like, oh, you have to be able to play all these things. You have to be all these things to everybody. And, and instead it's like, no, what, what, what is specific about your pain and how you've moved through it or your, your life story and how you've moved through it and how does that become the story that you present um, uh, to audiences when you're not playing somebody else or you're not directing someone else's play or, and how does that inform the lens in which you see the world? And that, that is sort of how I have, quote unquote, in that business sense, packaged who I am and, and, and made it. And that story has shifted and changed. I'm not just someone who dealt with depression and towards that. Now I'm a, a, a artist who ran for office. And so now I find myself working with non, like I've just been offered, um, uh, a chance to uh, work with uh, a ballot initiative that would help put uh, property tax towards public schools, right? Like this sounds so boring, right? But but this is actually a lot of nonprofits are now working with comedians and artists to, as sort of like mini PR agencies to kind of brand their message and 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 take the same skills I would have made in shows and 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 make. Uh, product to to I don't know if the word is product but but, but media to, to help communicate that that story and stuff so um, I don't know if this makes sense but but basically this idea of thinking that that don't rely on someone casting you or someone giving you a job to give you a job like I think your story has this value it's just a matter of like sort of packaging it for the world yeah I, I, I'll just agree with Christina because before I was an artistic director, I was a freelance director um, and um, dramaturg and playwright. And um, I, I actually think making work, I feel like to, you, to be true to yourself as an artist, all you have is you, you know, that you are what you bring to the work and your individual story, the, the I mean, the, way each of us would direct the same story would be radically different given who we are and what story we see in that text. Um, and so 
being authentic to who you are and and working on i mean and listen early in your career sometimes it's like oh i'm just so grateful i have a job you know and the standard early in my career that i tried to apply to that was can i hold my head up about having done this work meaning will i not be embarrassed to tell someone i participated in this and that is my that is my my that's a, a sort of touchstone for honor your own artistic integrity if you don't believe in the in in the in the piece or you feel it's harmful in some way um much as we all think we're never going to work again um initially it's partially about having faith in the lean times that the next thing is coming and if you can't find the thing if if you're waiting for someone else to hand you the opportunity and they're not handing it to you as Christina says, to kind of make it for yourself, to actually go into your friend's backyard or um, the church basement or, you know, the place where um, you actually get to share stories that are important to you. I, I, I am a profound believer that good work will out so that if you are making work you are proud of and believe in, people will find you. And then they'll be like, I saw that person do that cool thing. Or I saw that amazing costume design. Who did that? I'd love to pick it up and I'd love to find that person and have them do, you know what I'm saying? So I, I feel profoundly that you should both, I actually think as Christina, I love Christina's jacket analogy about all the, what, what do you need? What do you need? You know, but um, the, I actually think there are so many ways to engage and so many important reasons to do work. Not all of them are because it's a perfect play, but because there are other many valuable things that are useful in the experience. Um, and I, I think diversity of work that you do and gaining experience as part of the ways in which you continue to grow, but don't wait for people to give you permission. Take it, make it. I think one of the things that that I wanted you both to talk about, and it's in the document that you guys shared. Um, I hear so often, and I just had a conversation with, about this with Kimberly, who I think is on the call too. Uh, who's somebody that I've known for a few years, and Kimberly, I hope you're okay with me saying this. Uh, Kimberly is an incredibly talented emerging professional um, who had a, a concern that I hear a lot, which is like, when do I, and I'm paraphrasing here, when do I say I am a this, right? When, do, when can I say, now. oh yes, I'm a... Yeah. I'm a producer, right? What, like, when, when do you, when can you claim that? I say you say it right now. Like, if you use the word aspiring or starving, I, I felt like there was, there's this tendency for young artists to feel like they need to apologize that they want to be an artist, because it is a very bold thing to say, I, I'm this, and people, assholes, will challenge you and be like, well, what have you done? Well, just, I just do it. Just say, just say you do it and you do it. Um, because that word is like doctors don't go around saying I'm an aspiring doctor or a, maybe they say that, but they don't say I'm a starving doctor or I'm a starving lawyer. Like, why do we need to be so apologetic around owning this around some pot of money that someone supposedly gives us? Why are we giving it that power? So, so I would just get used to like writing your bio and just saying you're this, you yeah. Know? Even if you just did this little part, like you, you embody it and you own it and you live it. And that's, that's how you do it. And that's how people begin to take you seriously. Agreed. I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Say that again. Cause our my. <laughs> but, but if you can drop that, the aspiring or this sort of apologetic prefix and, and, and a lot with grant writing, they, they ask you to identify yourself as emerging or mid career or professional. And even among folks who have to use those terms we don't even know what that means anymore because like you're always starting all over from the beginning every time when you apply like I think I'm mid-career but I don't know like I've also just got an emerging Sherwood award last year right so it doesn't even matter but like just internalize like no this is the crazy decision I made to be an artist and that's that's what this is yeah 
I, I I completely agree. I think you have to own who you are. You know, for years, my father, I was directing for a very long time before I was officially able to quote, make a living. And I use that term very loosely uh, at directing. Um, and my father used to introduce me to people as my daughter, the temp, um, because I wasn't making money at the work I was doing. Um, and um, I think it's really important to claim who you are. I, I, I am complete agreement with Christina. Um, and I, I think you put out in the universe the um, person you are. And I'm also fascinated because I saw somebody uh, in, the, in the chat running by, somebody was talking about something about day jobs. And I'll just say a couple of things. It's a weird, dirty little secret that artists don't want to actually say that they have day jobs because they want to take themselves seriously as artists. And until we can re you know, form the funding structures of how artists are supported and value artists for artists, you know, I've I've always wanted to write a book about the the thousand the you know the thousand ways in the naked city that artists support themselves, which is not through their art form, um, and that doesn't mean you're not an artist. It means our systems suck in terms of supporting artists, you know. But I mean, also never diss the day job. I will say that, um, you know, I was my, in early in my in my uh, career, just out of um, school, I was copy editing for a, a gay men's fashion magazine. And um, we did a story on Che Yu, who was um, at the time had just become, there was an older version of CTG that had play labs and he was in charge of the Asian American theater lab. I'm not sure that's exactly what it was called. We did a story on him. He came in to drop off some photos. We started talking. It turned out he had seen a play that I had done with Playwrights Arena. Um, in a tiny 40 seat house the night before we started talking and that's how I first started working at what was then the taper um, in uh, you know because he had seen that work and so you just never know what's happening and 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 you should you know you have no idea what bread you're putting out on the water I think you have to claim your artist self and also I think it should stop being an embarrassment that people have to, I mean, it's actually, it's a shame on our society that artists actually, it's, it's not a shame on us that we actually can't afford, you know, to do what we do. It's, a, you know, so I feel like we have to both own those things proudly. I would also say that with a day job, if you're picking like, as I know I was in that stage uh, when I finished school, I was like, should I be a waitress? Cause that seems to be what actors do because that's like the, it frees up your time to think. But I actually did, was a host at a restaurant and I was so bored. And I was like, I'd rather work at this arts nonprofit making $10 an hour because I can learn way much. So I would say, think about, you know, it's not just like time to make money, but it's also time to learn a different skill and be around things and people. And I actually got more from working at an arts nonprofit, which was on the 18th Street Arts Complex. So I was next to highways and I got to see shows at highways and got to talk to other artists. That was more meaningful. It was, it was grueling work, um, but like then wandering around a restaurant pouring water for people like that, that you know it's for some people they they prefer that kind of day job because it turns their brain off from thinking all the time and they can observe people but uh, there's no perfect day job but I think there is something to be said about the time that time being used as learning time towards your craft that can complement I've heard it also called like don't call it a day job call it your complementary job mm -hmm. and that I think is a great way of shifting how you think about the the money earning job is is that that it actually can serve you as an artist Absolutely. The, uh, the Actors Fund calls this a portfolio career, calls a lot of artists have a portfolio career. So what's in your portfolio? And people construct it all different ways. I was a copywriter as well for a lingerie website called Wicked Temptations, which still exists. Uh, if you're on a school computer, do not look it up. <laughs> well, um, just to say, I mean, like copy editing at a, at a gay men's magazine was being on the cutting edge of a lot of culture and it was incredibly valuable. So, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I do wanna talk about um, money management and we're gonna have 
two different uh, sessions, one on the finances of theater, kind of producing theater, and one on personal finance for artists. So this is something that will be a thread. Um, but Christina, in, in the handout that you prepared, you talked about your two bank accounts. Uh, can you share a little bit more about your strategy? Because you were when we did a prep call, you had some, some more um, sure. to say about that. Some, some people are much better accountants than I am. Um, and they're able to just have one bank account and they're able to set the money aside that goes for different projects. And once I started to get paid for stuff, it, it, it didn't make sense to pay for projects and my rent out of the same bank account. Like I was not good enough at looking at a spreadsheet to keep track of stuff. So I just began, uh, one, I did a, a budget to figure out, which is really important to do, what are your bare expenses for the month? Like reasonably, what are those expenses? What is rent? What is food costs? What is your transportation? Um, there's lots of templates online where you can figure out what those line items are. What are taxes going to cost? And I put all that income from making art into one bank account and, and then would write myself a salary check every month. And this is not just like, I feel like I get eight grand this month. Like it's, it was a, it's a, it was kind of consistent to what my expenses were and what felt right about what I make. And I, I, I know that some folks will be like, well, what if I'm only making 10 bucks? Then you manage that 10 bucks. You get in the habit of, um, of, just okay you, you put 10 bucks here and then 10 bucks goes into your salary account but also all my business expenses uh that are paid in that one account i also have a, two credit cards one to, for just the business expenses um and one for personal expenses so i'm not paying groceries and paying for set pieces out of the same credit card um how i i'll write off both maybe i won't write off groceries you can't do that but like you know, like there, there are creative things I can do with my taxes at the end of the year, but it, it does help me keep track of um, how money gets spent. So I, I really recommend that because I know a lot of artists who are still using the this, like the same one account and they, they also seem to be unable to save. Jessica, what's your system? <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually do. I mean, I think I'll just say speaking as a director, um, you get paid in giant lump sums. And so one of the biggest challenges I have is like some months I think I'm rich, but, and I have to remind myself that that, and giant, by the way, is a complete ridiculous word just to say, you get paid in chunks. And so in the month where you've gotten paid a chunk, you're like, look how much money I have without remembering, no, that money has to last me for three months. You know, so I do have, um, um, I, because I am, and I, I actually, you know, I do have a home office and I do write off part of my rent or, you know, um, I actually do attribute the ways in which I am a freelance artist and I, and this is not about budget, I'll get back to budget in one second, but just even when you have, when you're an artist and um, it's possible that, I mean, everyone in the world right now has a quote home office, but um, when you're artist, when you are an artist, oftentimes your home is also your office. And this sounds ridiculous, but um, like I had to make myself like, I'm going to read plays and do other work in the library, which is the room I'm in now. And I'm going to actually read novels and do other recreational things in the living room just so I could know when I was working and when I was not, if that makes sense, because otherwise the tendency is to work, you know, get up, work, go to bed, like at one in the morning, get up, work, and all those things. And so that was really important. But also in terms of money, I had a savings account. I have a savings account that I, when I get paid in a chunk, I take part of it and I put it in the savings account, knowing I'm gonna draw it out as I run out of the stuff that was in the checking account, but that's how I don't go, oh, look, you have an, you can go buy a thing. It's like, no, no, that is actually rent for the next couple months, you know? And I, I put a, a um, Pamela in the chat was asking about accounts. Like I, it's, everyone might have their own system, but in my, I need to divest from Citibank, by the way, but like in my Citibank account, uh, maybe you have a credit union or whatever, I, I was able to create sub accounts inside of it, like yeah. 10 accounts. And sometimes the bank teller is like, why? Why do you have so many sub accounts? It's like none of your business. And some are marked for retirement, emergency, yeah. home improvement. Yeah. 
what else is in there? Um, homeowners taxes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just different expenses that make that, that I specifically have. Um, and so I make sure like when I pay myself that, that salary check, then I move over each one. And I had to dip into the emergency when this all started because yeah. I've had a bunch of gigs postponed. So I was, a lot of people were really worried about me because they're like, Oh my God, Christine is a performance artist. But it's like, no, I've, that money was more for a health emergency, but I guess this is a public health crisis. Um, but yeah, yeah that's, so I think that's why I also say to stop saying you're starving or aspiring because you will, you will begin to internalize that you're not supposed to have anything and it is completely valid and okay for you to have, some, you know, income for you to be able to save, for you to be able to talk about retirement investments and things like that. Like, don't let people make you think that you're supposed to not be making money doing what you do. Yeah. Um, same. same, same, Christina. I neglected to mention that I also have an account that is like, I try to pay a little over what I'm supposed to pay every month. And that's my house account. So if, you know, the air conditioner breaks or the you know, and I'm lucky that I have an air conditioner, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, I move some money into there so that I can actually take care of that kind of thing. So, yeah. I think also what you all are bringing up is about to me sustaining this career. Mm -hmm. um, I, d it's kind of, it's like an open secret that the vast majority of people who major in theater uh, leave the field. Yeah. Right? the vast majority. And so, you know, of my, of the people that I graduated with in my, my graduating class, all of, all of whom were very passionate about theater, there are two of us still doing it. So I, number one, I don't know why we shy away from that because that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of those folks found careers that incorporate their theater education and take it to a different way. But um, thinking about what has been helpful for you to keep you invested in this field and to keep you excited about this field? And I think this is um, particularly salient right now as uh, it's, it's always scary to think about going into theater. And I, I, for those of you who are participating right now, I just want to acknowledge that it is scarier right now to think about going into theater and especially those of you who just graduated. So what is the, um, what keeps you here and what keeps you excited about being here? I'll, I'll jump on that for a second and just say one of the things, I mean, I just want to, I want to tell another dirty, I want to reveal another dirty little secret, which is I don't, I actually would be really, I'm, I bet that Amer TCG has these statistics about how many directors in this country are purely making their living from theater directing. Um, and it might be 20 people in the whole United States. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, maybe that's a little low, I don't know. But, um, you know, it, it, even, even when you're working at major regional houses, I mean, below Broadway, but major regional houses, the, the finances are really challenging in terms of how many shows you can productively accomplish in a year and things like that. So all of us, <laughs> all of us have that jacket, you know, and one of the jackets I'm incredibly passionate about is actually um, sh two, two different things. One is I also make a lot of theater for young audiences because I believe passionately that, um, which by the way is equally badly paid. Um, but, um, <laughs> but I actually passionately believe in, exciting the next generation about this art form that we do and its power to change the world. But I also teach um, and I teach in a variety of places and spaces, universities, but also private places. Um, a lot of what I teach is actually new play development, um, script development with playwrights and directors learning how to work together on new plays. And that is one of the things that keeps me it's, it's a little bit of help financially, not huge, but even more, it actually keeps me in touch with the, the, all the people who are here right now. It gets, I, I get to know them better. I learn what's going on, what, what, what's important to, um, to the younger generation. And, and I, I hopefully get to nurture and help grow their brilliant artistry to kind of go out into the world. And so that's, that's one of the things that I, I love that keeps me filled that 
at the moment, I, you know, I just wrapped my UCLA script development class on Tuesday. Um, and, uh, you know, and I am not directing anything right now. <laughs> not surprisingly. <laughs> I think uh, for me, I, I think this moment, which we've prefaced this whole thing, we see you white American theater and this implosion and this cultural moment. I, I mean, I'm not performing my, I actually did a few, I did perform my show. I created a show for Zoom called Christina Wong Sweatshop Overlord about how I've been sewing masks uh, and been leading a group called the Auntie Sewing Squad, which is literally aunties sewing masks for very vulnerable communities and we are still sewing masks three months later because even though you see people selling masks in the street, there are First Nations, there are people at the border, there are all these communities that don't have access to them. Um, and I was just like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna make a show, I'm making a show. And I just made a post on Facebook and I tagged every presenter who'd ever presented me like, uh, hey, I got a Zoom show, you wanna bring it? And, and a lot of theaters right now, um, they don't have the same budgets to present my Zoom show than if they brought me out for the week. But a few of them have, have uh, have some honoraria and have presented me on Zoom and um, so I think it's it's I, I I think this generation knows how to pivot. You're a YouTube generation, <laughs> you know how to do this stuff, and it's okay to just be like, you know, what? I'm doing a show, I'm doing a show, and it becomes your deadline. Is that all these people are watching you on Zoom and the the bar for Zoom theater is so low, it doesn't even matter. Like I realized like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever, I'm just basically screaming my diary out loud into the, I'm going, where's the elastic? Like I'm just screaming this for like 60 minutes, but I'm also, I don't have to be memorized because I'm reading it off the thing. And people are like, this is so great. So uh, I, I feel like, like it's, uh, that's what is exciting is we, we have tools to make culture. There are no rules. The worst thing that can happen is people just leave your Zoom room or you get bombed or something. But, um, but I've also been pivoting and doing comm commencement speeches barefoot in my living room. And um, I'm quite busy on, on Zoom. Like in, uh, it, it, uh, the fact that I've built my own set pieces has helped. I've just pushed them up into my, it's not the, the extent to which I perform my live shows. But, but I think what is, it feels exciting that I can report on this current moment and there are no rules really. Um, in, uh, I, I guess there are some theater critics of Zoom, but uh, they haven't reviewed me yet. So I'm still in the clear, but like <laughs> that's, that's what is so cool is, is that if we can think of ourselves, especially if you are of a marginalized identity, um, that our existence is political and, and and you have something to say beyond someone else's words. And what are those things that you can say? Because this is the moment it needs to be heard. I love that. And that I, you know, thank you for mentioning Anti Sewing Squad. I just put the link to the Facebook group in the chat. I don't, is that the right place to send people the Facebook group? Facebook.com slash Anti Sewing. I might have, we might have sent you to our private group. Oops. Which is fine if you can sew and be my free labor, but, um, but yeah, facebook.com. Um, so I, I do want to talk about what you all have been doing. I, um, I was joking with my team members that I want to make like a COVID conversation bingo and that the middle circle would be pivot because like, everyone's like pivoting. Yeah. Um, so how have you both pivoted and or what are you thinking about? What is theater going to look like in the next few months or a couple of years? What what are we what are we doing here? It, are we going to be doing more Zoom theater? Are we seeing exciting things coming through? Oh yeah, uncertain times is a good is a better free space for the bingo. I like that, Jesse. <laughs> uh, Jessica, I know you you and Boston Court have been thinking about some some possibilities. Anything that you want to share? Can I also add to my question for Jessica, like yes, a physical space. Like I, I don't have to manage a space and I'm really, so I, I'm not dealing with that same panic of like, who's paying the rent? What are we doing with empty space? What about all the subscribers who bought tickets? Like I would love to hear answers to that because I can talk about all day long how I pivot, but I'm interested in when you have real world physical things you need to take care of. How that sure. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Pivot, innovate, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Just to say, uh, we recently, apropos of, you know, subscriptions or their memberships really, you know, where we created a seasonless 
subscription basically where anyone who bought a subscription, it will be good for the next three years. So to take the pressure off, oh no, nothing happened and you paid for something you never received, you know? Um, so that is a, a genius pivot that um, Jenny, our marketing and subscriptions person did. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the biggest questions for making theater in every way, and Boston Court also does music and art. So what, all, all of those questions, in addition to making the audience feel comfortable and safe, is how do we make sure that artists are comfortable and safe? And, um, and so that is a really challenging question. A lot of um, work as we know it involves not social distancing, involves characters who physically closely interact, whether they're actually making out or fighting or, or just dining together or something, you know, <laughs> or, or doing brilliant um, ritual movement. All of that rarely happens six feet apart with, you know, and all of those things. So one of the biggest questions really is, when can we safely IRL share art um, that is safe for the artist as well as the audience? I mean, Boston Court, I'm, I have said this in another panel, <laughs> but this is true. One of the kind of unique advantages that Boston Court has, some other physical entities have this advantage, but probably not all, is we have an enclosed parking lot and we are seriously planning to share work in our parking lot. We are, Jesse Soto, who is our production manager, uh, is designing socially distanced circles. We have an outdoor stage. We have a staging area for artists outside. Um, audience members can bring their own seating so that they are not concerned about what germs they just sat on. <laughs> um, and um, we w went to the parking lot last Tuesday to kind of check time and temperature um, in terms of what time could we start the performance. And it's, it's really complicated, but it does feel like there is a way um, to actually offer communal um, experience outside where it is reportedly much safer than inside as soon as it's officially safe to do so. So at the moment in the fall, we are planning some parking lot programming. Um, but just to say in terms of plays, um, there are just a couple exceptions, uh, but otherwise in readings and socially dist you know, keeping artists socially distanced is also very important. So that is a big, thing that we're wrestling with in terms of how to share work. But at the moment, we are planning for fall parking lot programming. That's amazing. That's awesome. And Christina, I, you know, you've, you've looked at like what, what is performance a lot in your career. So it, it feels like it, it is the anti-sewing squad theater. Is that performance? Social practice. And, um, I, I've been saying, yeah, being stressed out publicly about running a sweatshop, making masks has been a great calling card because I've gotten a lot of like bones thrown to me like, hey, can you, that's how the commencement speech at San Francisco State happened was one of the aunties is a professor there. And so, I mean, it's, it's something to be said that I finally get to present a different side of myself to people. That's not just me hustling people to get to shows. It's like me being generous. <laughs> and, and like, I think that that has actually opened a lot of very different kind of connections that aren't based on me necessarily trying to be friends with somebody because they can give me something down the road or because I want to work with them down the road. Like when I started making masks, it was really just to keep people alive, not realizing how deeply political it was going to get and that we would now get to the point that we are doing relief fans to the Navajo Nation, you know, but um, but the weird side effect of this, and this is not to say so masks so you can have a theater career, is that it has actually brought this whole different kind of community that is that is now booking me for speeches and um, we have a we have a possible book deal now coming um, from that because of uh, one of our aunties is Rebecca Solnit who's a very prominent feminist writer with a lot of pull of course
course in the writing world. But, uh, but that said, like what happened before all this is I had a tour of my show, Christina Wong for Public Office, which was supposed to be, a, it's a campaign rally because I was gonna have this timely show that responded to all the rallies that we were supposed to be at right now. And there are no rallies, right? There's gonna be one in Oklahoma. We're gonna see how that goes. Um, uh, but but I ha I'm having conversations with the theaters that I was supposed to go to where some of the conversations have gone to like, well, we could try to seat people in our 1200 seat p space, one every six seats. And I'm just like, oh, I don't know. I, I still don't even know if I wanna get in an airplane. Um, but I'm also pivoting to try to figure out how to perform it for Zoom, like with some, like UC San Diego, they're like, we, we're thinking maybe of setting up a TV station where you come here and do it for the TV station. And, but there are some schools that are still interested in residency activities. So I would teach sort of one hour workshops. So I don't know, that's the wild west. And I also am now getting questions, well, if this school tunes into the show, can they just pay a little bit more? Like, uh, like licensing fees. And I'm just like, oh, this is so, so I don't even know how to navigate that, but that is sort of what's happening. And I'm trying to figure out how to, how to best advocate for myself. So I'm learning, but that's sort of what that, those conversations have switched over to. I actually think it's a, the wild west of how um, people charge for online sharing is a, is a next giant question and how, you know, what is how to honor the artist and also make it accessible and not price it out of some being something for everyone and it's such a it's a i i i couldn't begin to solve it i think it's the next big question you know and on that next big question when you all are working with emerging theater professionals hiring them thinking about collaborating with them especially considering where we are right now and um, that there are going to be so many new questions. What are you looking for in emerging theater professionals, regardless of whether they're actors, producers, designers, directors? What are the qualities that make you go, okay, this, is, this person is, is newer to the field and I am super excited to work with them? For me, it's a certain like flexibility and those folks who know how to do a lot of different things, like this is this is your moment. <laughs> if you were a great technician and a decent actor and you sort of knew directing, this is your moment. Like, um, is if you only do that one thing and it doesn't translate into a way you can pivot, it's 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 tough. And I'm not a good tech person, um, but I can do a bunch of other different things. So yeah, I I would look for that. But also just this enthusiasm to just like let's try this. Let's try that. Like, don't don't bulldoze me with your ideas that to the point you're not listening to me. But like, I think there's a certain because it is the wild west. If you have a brighter idea than me, yeah. you know, hey, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I'm always looking for passion. That's it. I I uh, you know I just I think <laughs> to make a life in the theater is so hard in so many ways that if you are not passionate about it, I mean, if it is not the thing you're addicted to and can't imagine another thing you could be happy doing in the same way, um, maybe it's time to get out early where you, you know, um, just because it's, it's really challenging. So if you're passionate about it, if you need to do it, um, and as Christina says, I, I, I'm always looking for passion great ideas and as she says flexibility you know um to and and then and then great ideas on the great ideas oh that's the way in which this wants to go how about this then you know a, a kind of a yes and and also if if there's a really terrible idea i'm sorry that really feels wrong to me you know to stand it does i don't care how old you are you you know you you have a a really good brain and and a well-developed sense of who you are and what you think is, 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 has integrity and is right and wrong. And I, I think respectfully sharing that so that um, younger voices aren't silenced is also really important. And I have one more to add. I think also being aware of the current moment, which is what we yeah. talked about. Like it's uh, to, to, I, I find when kids are like, 
I say kids like you all, <laughs> but are able, you know, they ask for pronouns and, and are aware of when they're talking too much and that kind of stuff. And I, I think that's so important and a lot actually needs to be taught, like it's being taught better in college than older institutions are absorbing that. So, um, but I think modeling that is, is actually where I'm catch, playing catch up because I graduated college 20 years ago, you know? So there's something to be said about bringing that to the table, that sense of how to have equitable conversations. Absolutely. Um, I, we're getting some good questions. So now um, in the Q&A, if, if there are things that you are curious about, um, please feel free to use that. We'll try to pull a few up. We won't be able to address all of them, but um, we'll try to identify some trends. And one that really does seem to be a trend is a um, discussion of like a multi-hyphenate. Uh, so in colleges and universities and in high schools, you are often pathed pretty hard to one thing, like, oh, you are a director. And then post college and university, we see a, a broadening. Almost everybody broadens and becomes that slash, 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 right? So, um, and I've, I've felt even just in the time that I've been in the field, which is like, I don't know, 15 years or so, that there's been a, a greater acceptance of people not identifying as just one thing, that now kind of multi-hyphenate, multidisciplinary is a little bit more, um, accepted, I guess. Uh, how do you move through your career as a multi-hyphenate? How, how do you promote yourself? Somebody asked specifically, like, what, is, what should my LinkedIn say? What should my resume say? If you aren't, like, laser focused on one aspect of theater. I think either of you could speak to that, too. I don't know, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I I guess I, I, I have a few things. Christina Wong is a performance artist. I said performance artist first, which is a term that freaks a lot of people out because there's so much bad performance art, but it just felt like a way to kind of confuse you with what the hell I am. Um, performance artist, comedian, writer, and elected official. I, I think you can just have a few commas in there. But. I actually think you should, it's great to, like being a theater generalist, there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I will also just say, because I saw somebody say, should the portfolio job also be on the resume? I saw that was one of the questions. And, you know, I, I would say, uh, know the audience and tailor, tailor who you are to um, the people. And if they are open to, if it seems, like if you're applying to work in an institution, a large institution, by the way, you know, the multi-hyphenateness of you might be very valuable because they will see that you have a lot of skill sets that you could apply or interests that, you know, you could be a production intern or you could actually be a marketing intern or you could be a, you know, or all, the, all those things if you were uh, applying to do that. Um, I will say that if you're if you're actually just to say really speaking really specifically to actors when i get an acting resume i know you do film i personally prefer a resume that starts with theater i mean i'm i'm sure film is a huge part of it but if you're if you're sharing a resume with me because you're auditioning for a play um it's helpful to me to sort of see the theater take precedence and there's something that agents often for film ask people to write lead, lead, supporting lead. And that is not valuable to me as a theater director. I'm interested in what role you played and the kinds of plays you did. And I'm interested in, in all of it, you know, the theater, the director, the, the, the character you played and all those things, because it's just helpful for me to understand the breadth. So in a film audition, that's probably a really small thing at the bottom of that resume, but the theater audition, it wants to actually not be lead, you know, supporting, it wants to be more specific. So I would say, I think you should proudly own all the strings in your bow. But I think that when you're communicating, depending on who you're communicating with, highlight the thing that feels most useful. And I also would always just, you know, make sure that the other things you do are also available so people know the breadth of you. I mean, 
I don't think it's valuable to get people stuck in thinking you just do this one thing if you also do these other things brilliantly. I'm, uh, I want to, uh, give my, so I sit on a lot of panels where I'm watch, reading through bios of like solo artists who are applying for grants. So it's a little bit different than like casting an actor, but I always find it's useful to have like one or two intriguing details in a bio, not just like I could do this, that, and this, but just like that, 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 that weird detail that makes me remember them. Um, that is somewhat personal, like, uh, I was born in Iran and um, <laughs> and was a uh, bicultural, raised bicultural or something like that, you know, just something that's more than just a list of commercials you booked or, or things like, um, but just that weird detail that, that makes me want to, if, if I'm in a room with you, tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, and if you don't have those weird details, <laughs> then go live a, an amazing, crazy life and then come back. <laughs> <laughs> with a weird detail. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I put a couple of resources in the chat. There's a job application YouTube series um, that, that CTG did. Um, and also we've got a, a whole working in theater career series. A few of the questions I think in, in, that I'm seeing in the Q&A might be, it might be helpful to look at those. We have like downloadable one sheets, including how to talk to your parents about the arts. Shout out to Jesus Reyes, who came up with that title and I love it so much. Um, but yeah, bringing your whole self to the work. I mean, I said like the copywriting job was soul sucking. I, I know a lot about different types of lingerie that I don't need to know. Um, however, that job led to my first job at Arts for LA because I had backend website experience and that's what was needed in the arts advocacy. And then that job led to this job you know what I mean? So there's also like understanding that that even things outside of immediate theater can be relevant and they're all part of who you are, right? And they're yeah. all assets. Neil, you saying that you were a copywriter for a lingerie catalog was like, that to me would be like such a fun sentence to read at the end of a bio that would make me go, oh, she's not just like a sing and dance and <laughs> actor, but it's intriguing and very human and, and makes me... Yeah remember, oh, what about that lingerie writer person? Let's look at that. Absolutely. I mean, you have to, you, you bring, we as artists bring our whole selves to everything, right? Um, so yeah, it's all, it's all relevant. It's really, but figuring out how to tell your story, because this is all, this is all storytelling. How do you tell your own story, right? Um, okay, we have about uh, 15 minutes left. I'm looking through here. Uh, what are some things, I'm seeing a few about um, how people can get ready to step into professional theater, whether they're in high school, whether they're in college. Um, one of the things that I really loved about the sheet that you both created um, is talking about research and what, what you can do and should be doing independently to learn more about the field. And Christina, you spoke, like the, your very first bullet point there is about uh, researching people, yeah, in jobs that you're interested in. Well, is in the odd career, and I looked to I, the great advice I got was like, look at people who are doing what you want to do, and just read their bios and quote unquote stalk them a little. Like, don't show up in front of their house, but like, get a sense of like, what were those people in place? Now, this isn't everyone has a different map, and for so, some folks, like. Uh, like I, I'm the first artist in my family, right? And the first person to pursue this. And, and it, it's not always useful to look at someone who comes from a long lineage of artists and was born into the theater and whatever, because I didn't have access to that. Um, but it is useful to, to, to understand like what kind of grants they applied for, who their teachers were, um, what their community was and, and, and try to sort of build a strategic map of where I might also want to try to situate myself or what festivals I want to apply to or whatever. Um, so that, that's, I think, really useful. I think also just like, rather than, I think so much of like the, the, the narrative of theater is like, and then I auditioned and then it just happened. But that's not really how it plays out. Like, you might just want to name the goals you want and what are all the steps backwards that lead to that now. And there's gonna be different maps and there's gonna be things that derail it, like a pandemic <laughs> or like a complete implosion of the field. So to think about like 
Just make a clear map that's not based on just wishing and hoping. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add to that. Christina, first of all, I just love being in this conversation with both of you, you and Camille, because you have such genius wisdom, just to say. Um, and I'll add to that, you know, I do have a thing, I think, in my, um, my, my list of 10 things that is about getting to know the community that you, I mean, pretend you're not hanging out in Los Angeles, pretend you're going to go to another city. I always think it takes, a, it takes some real time to get to know the places and spaces that you respond to who are making work that excite you. Um, I do sort of ask myself to, unless, unless something is radically offensive instantly, give every kind of company or entity at least you know, artist group, at least two to three chances to kind of introduce me to who they are, because first of all, they often, you can't get the breadth of somebody, of, of any, anyone's passion and interest in one experience. You can tell if you're excited about them or not, but, you know, they, they may be doing radically different kinds of work. And then make sure that you are being in touch. I will say that every, um, assistant director I've ever, almost every assistant director I have ever had, which are usually a very early career person who's interested in directing, have happened because they emailed me. And they've said, I saw this thing you did and I thought it was really cool and I'm just wondering if by any chance you need, you know, you might need an assistant director or I'd love to be a fly on the wall. And it's usually happened in an opportune moment when I, and I, ha, I now keep a folder of people who have actually reached out. And if I don't need an AD, I've shared that person with someone else I know might be looking for one and that kind of thing. And um, uh, it really is about when you are in touch with the, um, with the entities, artists, individual artists or, or companies that you are excited about, make sure you know who they are and can speak to it and talk about why you're excited. It's not enough to just say, wow, I like your stage. I think my play would look great on it. Um, but have a better sense of the kind of work that the, that company is doing and if you're aligned. And then once that's the case, respectfully reach out. And when I say respectfully, I think what I mean is that all theater humans are exhausted, overtaxed, and under-resourced. So um, to be like, I didn't hear from you, you know, um, in a punitive way um, is probably not valuable in terms of your future interactions with the company. But certainly in small theater in LA, for instance, if you go up to the person who's selling chocolate, that is probably a company member um, who knows a lot about the company. So just to go to a show and talk to anyone who's working there and say, I love this, I love that play. I think what you just did is incredible. How do I get involved? You know, is really, I mean, share your passion. And then if you are emailing uh, someone and you know, one respectful reach back in, if you haven't heard back in a week or so, you know, to say, I really am not trying to bug you. I'm sure you're busy, but I, I did share this. I sent this email and uh, just, you know, reaching back to see if you have a moment to respond. Um, and then, and, uh, and, and I, I think it's really important to know that, that even when people fail to respond, you shouldn't assume they hate you, they're not interested, they just forgot and it went by in a giant email list and they forgot and they couldn't get back to it. So, um, so I, I just want to say, do not assume that because you don't hear back from people that it means they're not interested. They could truly just be busy. Um, and, you know, at a certain point, if you've sent four emails, <laughs> you know, maybe they're not interested and they're not having the courtesy to tell you. I don't know. You know, I will say that always with, in my case, it is purely that I, I got 400 emails that day and I, I accidentally skipped 20 of them, you know.
I feel like it's also a combination of, I realized at a point I was, I was hustling so hard just to, tour, to get my show out because I was my own booking person at that point, was I was spending more time booking than working on the craft or making new stuff. And, and I know we only have so much time, but I think it's important to constantly stay in practice. Like it's a marathon, not a sprint, you know, <laughs> think about what is that next thing, that's that, that next challenging thing you want to make. And uh, and not just feel like I made this masterpiece solo show and you're going to tour it and then give me a career after. Like, it's just like, it, it, it is this balance of not resting on your laurels and constantly kind of, um, having not just, uh, contacting people with the email, but, but them seeing your work in the world. Right. And I'll, I'll just, I want to, I want to augment that. You have no idea what bread you're casting on the water and how, when it's going to bear fruit. I will just say, um, we, I was doing a musical, um, we auditioned, we had to replace one of the actors when it actually went to New York and we saw an actor that we loved and he was so dissimilar in, um, in sort of quality to the original guy that we cast another guy we loved, but we always loved that guy and we thought he was amazing. And five years later, when the same creators were doing the next musical, we called him. I'm actually talking about Harrison White, who's an amazing, a beautiful actor. And we said, hey, we're developing a new musical. Would you like to be involved from the beginning? Because we think you're amazing. And um, that is an absolute true story. So I, as, as Christina says in the marathon, not the sprint, you have no idea what um, bread you are casting on the water and when it will come back to you and bear fruit. So have faith. Yeah, both in casting and, and also in grant applications. And I know people get really discouraged. They apply for a couple of things or they audition for a few things they don't and they leave the field. And there is something to be said that sometimes there's really hard, heartbreaking decisions that happen. Like, oh, that person would be so good, but just for something else. And so those, so as long as you still show that you're still working and you're out there, you might, you know, at some point you come into the community. But I, I think, think, also thinking of this as a community too, that these are ongoing relationships. It's not just someone says no to you and you're, you've been erased. Like you, you're, you're constantly meeting people that you will work with at some point down the road. Yeah, and the people you work with may advocate for you to someone else. Oh, I did, I just worked with that sound designer. I thought they were amazing. Oh, great. That resume just came across my desk. You loved working with them too. Fantastic, you know? Yes. So, yeah. And I wanna, I wanna highlight for two things. First, Abel just created an unofficial Facebook group for the summer series, which I love. Cool. So look in the chat if you haven't looked at that. Thank you, that's so cool. Next, uh, it's something that I, that I hope all of you will hear throughout the summer is this theme that um, you are, you have power over your career and that's for, for better or for worse, right? So I think there's a, um, there's something that I hear all the time from especially aspiring actors that the, the number one thing that people ask for is how do I get an agent? Um, and now we actually have a, a recorded uh, conversation from our Going Pro Career Fair that's on exactly that. So you can find that on CTG's YouTube channel. However, I think that that partially stem, stems from like, once I get an agent, then the agent sends me out and then I have a path forward, right? Even once you have an agent, this is a very, very active yeah. active field and that what you've been hearing from Christina and from Jessica and what you'll hear throughout the summer is that this is a this is not something where you sit back and and wait for opportunities to be given to you um, and again for better or for worse and I hope that makes you all feel empowered and excited and not um, afraid because it's a good thing it, and even right now there's a lot that you could be doing and I'm, I'm sorry that we're not getting to a lot of the questions there are a lot of amazing ones but the answer to a lot of the questions is you research it and you try to figure it out and you go and ask people and yes you can approach people through LinkedIn and yes you can approach people through their personal websites and and come coming from a place of research right a place of like because what Jessica said, I think is important. It, it's people reaching out saying, 
I saw your show and I want to talk to you. It's not people reaching out saying, here's my headshot. Aren't I awesome? Right? It starts with the work. It starts with that connection and that research. Um, we have another three minutes. I would love to hear from both of you what's living in you. Is there something that you really want to want to say? Um, something that you feel like hasn't been uh, addressed? Christina, do you want to start us out? Um, well, in the agent conversation, I think it's interesting because it's, yeah, I had, I had been con like this myth, you get an agent, it's all better. But like some agents are terrible people. Many are terrible people. And many of you don't like, I, 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 I worked with this terrible racist manager for five years. And I, I, and I, I, I was just so desperate to feel like I was being managed um, that I was like in this completely abusive situation. He was a white Republican who only dated Asian women. I, he did not date me, but it felt really awkward every time one of his new girlfriends would come by. Anyway, the point is like, and he would say crazy things to me about, well, no one's giving shows to uh, Asian women anyway, so why would I make that phone call for you? Like, this is clearly not a match. But in my mind, it was like, oh, do, what, do you have a manager? Like, there are bad managers. There are and, and sometimes you meet with them and they're willing to work with you. But if you have this feeling of like, I think I would fight you in a bar in any other setting, maybe, you know, it's okay to say no. You don't, <laughs> it's okay to be a free agent um, if you feel it's going to be a, a terrible situation. So, um, and, 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 and like to just not give your power away, uh, cause you are special. You're special. And, <laughs> and, and, ju and just because like this person is helping all their other clients, they, you don't get the sense they're doing that for you. Walk away. Yeah, I, I think riffing, I saw somebody, I saw one of the, sorry, the questions go by so fast. Um, I saw somebody say, Does, is it possible to, to, to work in the theater profession without a college degree? And of course it is. I, I think if I were going to just riff off what Christina was saying and what we've been talking about in the moment we're in is throw out the rules throw out the things we thought were rules. Like you have to have an agent to actually be a real actor, you know, or you have to have a college degree to actually be a real actor or, a, you know, or, or, or in any other kind of theater practitioner. I would say throw out the rules and live your truth with integrity um, and take your own power. Um, and, I, you know, for me, guiding principle in my world which does feel especially important right now is to tell the truth with love. You know, um, it feels like we both want to be, we want to be honorable and we want to be respectful. And having said that, throw out the rules. There are, you know, make, you know, discover new pathways and don't let anyone's, anyone's old definition of how, what success looks like define how you make your world. Fuck the rules, says Matthew. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> the rules, exactly. <laughs> LinkedIn profile. <Love> it. <laughs> Hire me. Done. <laughs> I love it. Uh, thank you both so much. This, I, this is such a wonderful start to this series. Everyone who has joined us, thank you. Thank you for participating in the chat. Thank you for these questions. I, I, the questions are also going to help shape the rest of the series. We have nine more after this. Um, so make sure that you check out the resources in that Dropbox for this session if you, if you haven't already. And I will I'll send out an email when the resources for next week are up. Um, I see, I, Christina and Jessica, you all can see the, um, all of the beautiful thank yous coming through. So. I will just say, everyone, please take care of yourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Yes. And we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye.